hearing, it seems to me, all day about um, data and how it's an increasingly powerful force in our lives. And uh, the couple of speakers that are going to be uh, coming on after me are going to talk exactly about that, and uh, we're looking forward to a lively debate. Uh, the first speaker is going to be the Honourable uh, Shirley Ann Jackson. She's the 18th President of Rensselaer um, Polytechnic Institute in Troy, uh, New York, and Hartford, Connecticut. Um, this is the oldest Polytechnic Institute in the United States, and it's my great pleasure to uh, announce her now. Good afternoon. You know, there's a significant transformation underway globally in the way we make predictions, make products, make connections, and ultimately make progress or not. The transformation I'm speaking of is being driven, of course, by the extraordinarily rapid expansion and the availability of data from multiple sources and ever more powerful analytical and computational capacity that is generating yet new information. So let me begin quickly with a, a vignette that may be a harbinger of things to come. As Superstorm Sandy, I'm sure you know a lot about it, was beginning to gather steam in the Caribbean five days before it slammed into New Jersey and New York, US forecasters were predicting a monster storm but were uncertain of its path. By most indications, this unusually powerful and complex storm would graze the coast but moved back out into the North Atlantic. However, there were steady reports of the European model, predicting a sharp left turn into the coast of New Jersey and New York with potentially devastating consequences. Now, the US and European models eventually converged, but the Europeans got it right first, giving a little more time for those in Sandy's path to prepare, no doubt, saving lives. The difference in the early predictions were the inputs and the capacity of the computers doing the modeling. Now, as intimated by what happened with the Sandy forecast, newly available information, how it is accessed, will become ever more vital as a force that shapes and changes our world. Big data-driven innovation will be a driver for changes, for changes in science and society over the next 50 years, in much the same way as quantum science was to technological and economic development in the 20th century. Moreover, there is a rapidly growing network of networks, the so-called Internet of Things, on which our daily lives depend, including power, water, retail, financial, manufacturing, and of course, social networks. Together, these comprise what the director of Rensselaer's High Performing Computing Center, Dr. Chris Carruthers, described as a human sustainability network, all driven by the interplay of data, physical systems, high-performance computing and analytics. I predict that big data and network science are going to merge, marrying the Internet of Data with the Internet of Things in new ways, and this will be world-changing. Just as in the 1800s there was a shift from electricity as a curiosity to a commodity made possible by the emergence of electrical engineering, so too now are we in a the midst of a shift in data as a commodity, and more importantly, data as a resource in ways not previously imagined. Now, data is growing at a volume much greater than the tools available to process it, but new tools are being engineered that will enable us to take massive amounts of structured and unstructured data and create useful information. During the past three years, in fact, the number of government data sets, federal government data sets available on data sharing sites has grown from 57 to more than 1 million. The number is expected to exceed 10 million by 2015. At Rensselaer, Dr. Jim Hendler and his team, he is one of the creators of the semantic web, collaborating with the White House, have developed smart interfaces that allow government data from a huge variety of sources to be combined in unexpected and beneficial ways. Now, the infrastructure and technology they have created is, makes it possible for others to mash up data sets and to develop more than 1,200 applications that are now driving uh, public policy. Now, if we take full advantage of these emerging technologies, new opportunities will be created by the ability with smart analytics to anticipate and predict events and to mitigate them. Now, the intersections and interactions are complex. The outcomes can be powerful and risky. 
powerful in that we will be able to see connections that we would not have seen otherwise and have better, better predictive capabilities, particularly on the trending of things. But risky in that interconnectivity can lead to sometimes abhorrent and certainly unintended consequences like flash crashes. So as we saw all too clearly in the devastating ways with energy communication and transportation systems in the aftermath of Sandy, interconnectivity presents enormous intersecting opportunities and intersecting vulnerabilities with cascading consequences. So I predict that the level of interdependence of these interconnected networks will grow rapidly in the next year and beyond. And if we're able to take advantage of the ubiquity of data, the interconnectivity of data and things, and powerful new analytical and computational tools to stay ahead of the curve, the future is ours. But there may be questions about the value of new digital information. So I further predict that because of the ability to gain new information and insights from data, and implicitly the ability to marry data with things, new economic models will emerge around data-driven information and innovation, both data at rest and data at motion, and there will be growing and new tensions and conflicts around the monetization of data, particularly with respect to ownership, privacy, and security. But we have to ask questions of whether our economic modeling processes can even keep up. How will this shake out? Only time will tell. Thanks. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Rachel Hout. She's New York City's first chief digital officer. Um, and that means that she's working to modernize the relationship between the government and the public um, in order to help the engagement online. Rachel. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy to follow the Honorable Shirley Ann Jackson, because I agree so much with everything that she just said. Um, so I'll be um, um, fairly brief and tell you a couple of stories, but essentially um, New York City itself has a very uh, data-driven mentality and we have a data-driven mayor in Mayor Bloomberg. And so what we see is our prediction, and in some ways it's already starting to be realized, is that in the coming years governments will use data to help to improve the way that we deliver, deliver services to the public to help to anticipate problems before they become problems, and ultimately to save lives. And a few ways that it will do this is first by internally tapping the potential of the vast stores of data that we do have access to, and making sure that agency to agency we're able to share that data. Then we want to make sure that city to city and government to government we're sharing data. And perhaps the most exciting frontier of this is when we open up these data resources to the private sector, to technologists, to civic innovators who can help us come up with solutions that perhaps we can't do on our own. And a couple examples of this include some of the work that's being done by a fantastic guy called Mike Flowers. You can check him out in the city of New York. The city today has over 900 open data sets available to the public, and Mike uses data to find ways to help save lives. One way that he has done this is that by correlating data sets that have previously never come together from the Department of Buildings, from the Census, from the Tax Office, and the Finance Bureau, we've been able to find a way to reduce firefighter injuries by 15% because Mike and his team can identify an increased likelihood that there's been an illegal conversion of an apartment building by looking at the number of people, for instance, on a tax record who say that they live in one place. In addition, Mike and his team have been able to reduce very significantly the amount of time it takes an ambulance to get to some to people in need. The way that they did this is they looked at a map, they saw there were clusters all over and they couldn't figure out why they were clustering in the same places. It turns out that people who are operating ambulances need three things 24 seven, food, coffee, and a place to go to the bathroom. And by finding other places throughout the five boroughs where you can serve those three needs, they were able to reduce the response time by a minute of an ambulance, which is a very critical amount of time. Finally, going back to Hurricane Sandy, the city of New York has now for two years exposed the um, hurricane evacuation zone data sets to the public. 
And this is incredibly critical for us because when Mayor Bloomberg issued um, an order to evacuate, we had such an influx of traffic that our servers were struggling to keep up with the request for people trying to find out which hurricane evacuation zone they were in. Fortunately, we had shared that data with Google, Google Crisis Group, with the New York Times, with WNYC.org, in fact, with the full public who was all available and able to use it. And they had built a fully functioning, interactive hurricane evacuation zone map that helped to step in and serve that function and truly helped us to do our job. And we estimate served 10 to 20 times more people than we would have been able to on our own. So ultimately, big data creates this potential, much like government, that we are able to accomplish so much more together than we ever could on our own. Thank you very much. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you about was actually uh, Hurricane Sandy. And um, I was wondering if you could talk about um, what you learned from the hurricane about designing uh, uh, the city for collecting data and also how you use data as well. Absolutely. Um, so we've, we've learned an enormous amount. Also with Hurricane Irene, we were already starting to share that data. So in the days coming, approaching Hurricane, as we saw Hurricane Sandy approaching the city, we knew that it was critical that we had that data out there in a format that was able to be used. Of course, the Office of Emergency Management changes where those hurricane evacu evacuation zones are based on the weather system that's coming in and different conditions and where the waters are. So they first rapidly had to establish the new hurricane evacuation zones and then get it out there in a format that was critical. And what we found, we've already done a couple of postmortems with Google Crisis Group and with other civic nonprofit volunteer groups that want to basically be helpful and help to serve the public is that it's critical that we have the infrastructure in place beforehand and that we have the data, we have it in a standard way, we have it in a real-time format so that they always have the most up-to-date data because data changes very quickly um, and it is often stored in different ways and different, um, has different titles and different, different categorizations and it can be different, d difficult to bring together two different data sets if there's not that level of normalization. And talking, I mean, what Shirley also was talking about was, I think, resilience in systems and the That's need right. to build in resilience. And, you know, as you're gathering all this data, you started to think, well, you know, there are key parts of the city that are just fragile and that need to be more resilient and that maybe we can feed that into the way you design the city itself. Absolutely, and I think that that's one of the things that we're actually actively doing right now. Again, Google is, is a good partner, um, but we're also looking at ways that we can collect that data potentially from the public, which is a very um, new thing for government to consider how do we make sure that it's authoritative enough and factual enough when it comes from the average citizen, but at the same time, how do we acknowledge that in New York City we have one of the most connected, technologically savvy populations in the world, and they could be a very powerful source of data if they're, if they're willing to help with that effort. I wonder if I could step back a minute and just draw you both into the conversation. And I was struck by the incredible sort of power of um, the vision that you paint, but also something very kind of troublingly Orwellian about everything that you're doing and that, you know, because you're talking about governments and institutions holding this sort of vast amount of data, that's fundamentally going to be troubling to people. And it's, it's not just privacy, although privacy is a huge issue, but it's, it's a question of just how much you can, how much is knowable, which is privacy, of course, but how much is knowable? And I think as human beings, we walk around kind of expecting a certain amount of privacy. We don't expect the government to be able to drill down to our neighborhood and know how many crimes maybe, how many parking tickets, how many permits, all the things that come, are becoming layered upon layer upon layer upon layer. And then on top of that, you've got who votes, how, and what they buy. Well, you know, that horse is out of the barn. Right. <laughs> and so I think the, the real question is, is, is how do we create a kind of common wheel, a collective viewpoint about how we use data to improve the way we live. Now let me just go back uh, just for a hot minute to, uh, to Hurricane Sandy because it, it really illustrates a number of the points that I was trying to make. First of all, you've already talked about essentially uh, uh, some elements of the logistics of disaster response. But there's an ability to be much more sophisticated about that and to do modeling not only beforehand, but in real time. 
but to engage, as you've said, citizens in helping to feed those models. But that requires a lot of capability, infrastructure, and computational power. The second part has to do with uh, predictive capabilities. And, and you know, the, the uh, models actually don't just depend on data on the internet. They come from things, from satellites, from buoys, from uh, weather stations, from airliners, even commercial airliners, et cetera. And the issue becomes, how do you bring all of that together in powerful ways that can improve predictive capability, as well as perhaps having smart uh, networks where what happens in one part of the network doesn't just come in in a dumb way into a central point, but can inform what happens to the other things in that network. And the, the final piece, which I think is very powerful in terms of planning, because you talked about how to build cities better. Right. But if you have, how many, what's the population of New York 8. City? 8.3 million. 8.3 million people already living here. Then there's another kind of internet of things that can play into all of these. And that really has to do with infrastructure modeling and monitoring. And that provide, becomes its own internet of things. And when you then marry that, which can really tell you something about how the infrastructure is really holding up and performing, even holding up and performing in normal circumstances, but especially when you have untoward events, that can play into the disaster, the disaster response model. So that is that marriage of the internet of data with the internet of things. So the building's going to be making the 999 call, uh, sorry, the 911 call as well as the human beings. Well, well de facto. Right. Exactly. If, if something's about to collapse, you can, you can censor it and right. you can know it. So why would you send um, firefighters or does that, uh, emergency response people into a, some facility that is about to collapse? So did you answer my question about Orwell? About, about how... We're Orwellian? <laughs> or did, we, did, you, I mean, did you say that we need to come to some kind of consensus? Is that what you were saying? Is that we need to... Or are you just kind of saying... We need more... Convert, it? No, I know I'm saying we need more... Um, conversations about the common good, about the common wheel, and to animate those discussions with examples. And then the question is, how do you protect uh, your, your privacy? Right. Well, in the beginning, it starts with you. So many of us have so much of ourselves out there, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And so that's what we have to think about. Right. But, but Do we then, get a chance to take that back? No. <laughs> I mean, you know, in a way, once the digital footprints are created, they last for a very long time. But, but maybe there is a cloak of privacy that comes from the ubiquity of data itself, that it becomes so much there that it is of less interest. I mean, what I found intriguing about um, the political campaign this time round is that just the extent to which uh, it was possible to marry big data and consumer data and really kind of um, predict uh, where voters were and how to go out and get them, and you can um, call it whatever you like, but in a sense, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether they know exactly how I'm going to vote. But, you know, they know that I won't buy a Hummer or, you know, that I like, I have a Prius and so they may be able to, to guess that I'm much more likely to donate or volunteer for the Democrats and stuff like that. And so, but that in itself, I mean, it, it, it seems to me I don't even have to um, give away very much and you already know me and that kind of I find a little bit troubling. But maybe uh, the audience finds that less so. Maybe you could talk about the economic consequences of some of the uh, predictions that you've been making. You talk about uh, a sort of uh, resource, an economic resource. Is that right? Well, if you think about the infrastructural consequences for New Jersey and New York, you know, where the governors, in fact, have uh, made appeals to Washington for uh, support in the range of about $70 billion dollars, that shows you the, you know, one uh, consequence of uh, a casting, uh, uh, one 
result of a cascading type of consequence. On the other hand, um, one can use the data to uh, strengthen infrastructure, um, to create uh, new models that go into uh, new codes that can lead to new ways people uh, develop uh, infrastructure, which can itself create new enterprises, but it can also strengthen the economic base of the, the, uh, the city, in this case, or the country. But when I also was talking about economic models, it's a question of, you know, the value is in how the data is put together and, and how you monetize that value. Uh, I think is, is an open question, but maybe you have some thoughts about that. Well, I, yes, well, I'd love to. First, you know, also go back a little bit to, I guess, the morality question, which I see as more as maybe um, we should think about framing it as, um, you know, what we hear from the public a lot, at least in New York City, is they want this data. They say, that's my data. And by opening it up, I think there's a whole element of um, you are empowering people in a way to have information that is completely unprecedented. I mean, the level of information that the average citizen has, or, uh, has access to is, is, has never been at this stage. And it helps us to potentially have a more informed citizenry and, and engaged uh, population. What, what have you seen as most positive outcomes of this engagement with the data? I know that we talked a little bit before about the apps that people are building on top of your data. So the city hosts a number of hackathons and app contests. One is NYC Big Apps, uh, which is a very successful competition, now going into its fourth year. And we've, through this contest, which is sponsored by uh, BMW iVentures, it's at no cost to the city or to taxpayers, have incentivized the creation of now 150 different apps using city data. And everything from finding the nearest recy recycling receptacle to a green market that's close to you to more fun things that if you check into a restaurant that's in danger of being closed because of a health code violation, you get a big alert on your mobile device that's called don't eat at um, <laughs> that four square mashup. Um, so we, so there's, there's a really a wide range. And what we're looking at now is how do we match make a little bit better between what the needs, especially of our neediest um, New Yorkers are, as well as with the, the, the wonderful capabilities of our, of our tech community. And the great thing is that there are so many people who want to give back. And there is no greater sandbox than a city like New York. Obviously, I'm biased. But it creates a great opportunity to really um, solve interesting problems and, and help people. One quick comment. Depending upon how data is used, it does not have to always have personal identifiers attached. Sure. And, and some of what we're talking about doesn't require the most personal information to be useful. Right. And of course, the city of New York is fully respectful um, of all privacy concerns in any possible way you can imagine. I mean, that's absolutely true. Whenever you talk to anybody who's using this data, they will say that they you know, abide by the rules and that they're concerned about these things. But nevertheless, I think, would you not agree that we are moving in a particular direction and it's very difficult to go backwards and it seems that there's only one way and that's forward and that's more, um, more sharing, more data and there are implications surely for, for all of our lives perhaps, yeah. I mean the world is changing <laughs> and it's, it's moving in a direction. You can't take back progress and you can't go backwards and the, as uh, you know, um, I think really all we can do is try to be as thoughtful about it as possible and strategic about it as, as we go forward. And, and to look at the opportunity set that it offers and to use the very interconnectivity to create new types of conversation because the public square has changed. It connects us with people in different ways, different geographies, across cultures. And, and I ha happen to think that is a good thing and it can help us to have different kinds of conversations. All right, well, I'd like you all to uh, put your hands together and thank my guests, Shelley Ann Jackson and Rachel.